doing projects where you feel like the uh, the message behind it, not just being entertainment, but being something that's going to maybe make people think a little bit um, is it, it makes me feel fulfilled. You know, it makes me feel like we're doing the right thing. Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we're joined by a very special guest. He is one of the finest cinematographers working in the industry today. For credits to his name, such as Kings of Summer and The Walking Dead, World Beyond. His work can now be seen on Rutherford Falls, starring Ed Helms, streaming on NBC Peacock. On the show today, the very talented Ross Rigi. How are you, Ross? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Hey, my pleasure. Once again, thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show today. How have you been over this last year? We're living in such a crazy world especially with everything going on and yourself as a creative artist, how did 2020 look like for Ross Rigi? Oh man. Well, it started off. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, Rutherford Falls came into prep and we started moving forward. And then of course, everybody was thinking, you know, is, is this COVID thing going to be anything or not? And, uh, sure enough, it, it kind of swept us all away. And, and then, uh, you know, I was fortunate that we were able to get back to work in August last year. Um, on the show, and at that point, one of the one of the nice pluses was that everybody was so grateful to be working, and so there was such positive attitude, and you know everybody was so uh, vigilant about being safe and you know doing their part. So, so that was nice. It was a nice way to get back to work, and um, and yeah, I've just been grateful that things have continued getting even busier. It's uh, things have been crazy in in 2021 everywhere. So, um, it's good that things are picking back up. Yeah, absolutely, and it's one of those things where it feels like we're going in the right direction with everything that's going on. And hopefully who knows by the end of this year, we'll return to somewhat of a new normal or whatever that may even look like, but uh, it's, it's really great to hear that the industry is still moving forward and a cinematographer and a creative artist like yourself is still getting a chance to flourish in these crazy times. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we all found different outlets uh, while we were home and stuck, uh, not being able to work. And uh, to a certain degree, I think that's that that's been nice. You know, people have had a chance to reevaluate things and focus on things they love. I do a lot of still photography and was able to spend a lot of time with my family. So those things kind of go hand in hand. So um, you know, it's you find these outlets, and I think it 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 helps you return even stronger and more uh, focused. So. For sure, there's definitely a silver lining in all of this, and I'm. It's good to hear so many people that have found or rediscovered their love of something they may have been really passionate about before and kind of fell off or even just connecting with our families or doing a lot of internal soul searching and just really appreciating the little things. So I'm glad that at least there's lessons to be taken out of all this. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Before we deep dive into Rutherford Falls, I'm really fascinated by your story. I really want the audience to get to know Ross Rigi. So where does this all begin? What were some of your early influences? What made you want to be in the creative arts? Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I was always into drawing in my art classes, you know, sculpture and all that stuff. And um, where I grew up, I grew up in Wisconsin and um, my high school actually lost their photography program a couple of years before I uh, went to high school. And so <clears throat> there wasn't a photographic uh, outlet for me uh, at school per se, but um, I did get a camera in high school and got interested in taking pictures. Um, but uh, but then a friend of mine and I <clears throat> started getting in, into um, puppetry, weirdly enough, and stop motion animation. And we had a class in high school that allowed us to make videos uh, instead of doing like a final report. And so, of course, we're 15 of course right? of course we're gonna make videos and you know not have to write papers so uh we just did a bunch of puppetry stuff and would would do interpretations of our like the history stuff in the class and um 
and we both got into we just started soaking up Henson's work and trying to learn how to build puppets and um, so in a way that was kind of my first uh, interest in getting into motion picture stuff uh, and you know on the side I was interested in photography so uh, as I went to college I went to uh, uh, NYU for film and television and I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, but I quickly found out I didn't I wasn't interested in directing really I'm a terrible writer and, and I was taking a lot of photography electives. So kind of by default, I was like, oh, I guess I'll shoot stuff. <laughs> so that was kind of the, that was kind of the start. And I still have a, a, a big soft place for puppetry and animation and all that stuff. And animation is, you know, it's still photography merged with cinema. So it's, um, you know, they all work hand in hand and all the, all the math you do and all the, you know, when you're thinking about what the image looks like when you're shooting, you know, you're really just shooting a series of still images. So um, that all kind of works hand in hand. So that was, I guess that's, that's kind of the start. I, I, have to admit that I was never one of those uh, kids that grew up watching Hitchcock when I was 10 and, you know, knew all the French New Wave stuff. I, I went to film school and I, I, I was fresh off of watching Office Space and Happy Gilmore and Dumb and Dumber yeah. over and over and everybody else around me was like <laughs> talking this different, different language. So I was out of my own that's, a little bit. Well, that's great though, because it just shows that there's so many different perspectives and so many different backgrounds that people come from that are in the film and television industry not everyone starts off with all the Hitchcock stuff gone with the wind and all those classics <laughs> like Dumb and Dumber man it's one of my all-time favorite movies so yeah. hearing someone being inspired by that it's just that's awesome yeah 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 I mean it's 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 the truth you know I came in and I felt I I have to admit I, I felt really uh out of my place definitely for those first couple of years because I was surrounded by people who've been dreaming of being directors and have been writing and making short films for years. And I was very new to kind of exploring what was the right path for me. And, um, uh, but it was also, you know, you can't go wrong moving to New York city after growing up in the Midwest. And, um, that in of itself was a big education to me. So being in the city, being around all these people with such passion for filmmaking and, um, you know, people from all walks of life was, was great. So good launching point. Yeah, for sure. Now, this is a question I love asking all cinematographers because I get different answers from everyone, but there's similar threads within all the answers. In your own words, how would you describe cinematography? Uh, uh, capturing a series of still images uh, and uh, um, taking into account light, uh, focal length, aperture, all the technical things and and trying to uh brush away all the technical and make something that's got emotion and feeling uh i guess it's not so much a definition or a single sentence answer but i feel like there's this kind of uh, merging of of the technical with the emotional um and uh i think that's where the art side of it comes in definitely and that's that's an awesome answer because i've heard similar variations of that where it's a clash of different art forms and mediums and it's almost like a snowflake where no two answers are the exact same but there's similar threads <laughs> yeah. between all the answers that's great i'm really curious as someone who didn't necessarily grow up watching all those classics and whatnot what was your first onset experience like and was it what you had thought it would be My first real set was uh, right. Actually, the summer after I graduated film school, I moved back to Wisconsin, and there just so happened to be a, a major movie shooting in Milwaukee uh, called Mister Three Thousand. It was a Bernie Mac movie, uh, yeah. baseball movie, and they shot most of it in New Orleans. And then they came up for I think it was like four weeks, and they shot the baseball stadium was new that summer, and so they used all the they used the stadium for all that uh, all that stuff. And um, I had been a production assistant and kind of a second AC in the summers uh, while I was in school um, in Milwaukee in the commercial market there. And, and so when I moved back, of course, I was like, what a great opportunity if I could get involved in this somehow. And one of the local producers um, was hired on the, on the movie to do some local, some work, we're interfacing with the local community. And, um, and she managed to, to get my foot in the door. And I was actually doing, um, I was a PA doing flat people in the stands. It's basically these cardboard cutouts to make it look like they're people in the stands. Um, I did that for a week and then I ended up getting a chance to jump into the camera department and I was uh, like a camera PA and I'd run film mags uh, uh, in a golf cart underneath the stadium out to the, the uh, camera truck in the parking lot. So I did get more hands-on than I would have ever dreamt I would have coming out of college. Uh, 
I think prior to that, there hadn't been a big movie in Milwaukee for 15 years or so. I think Major League was the previous kind of movie of that size. So I got lucky in that sense, but it was uh, it was definitely eye opening. I mean, even being in, being in New York during film school, you're, I was on a bunch of different weird little sets, and um, and walking around the city, you see the trucks and the the shoots going on. But right. to be inside of it and be a part of it um, was really uh, invigorating and exciting. And I think it definitely cemented my desire to to really continue pushing into it. Um, but I always. I always tell people too, and we laugh about it on set all the time. In the end, there's, you know, you drive up to set and no matter how big the show is, you drive past all these trucks and generators and people and parking lots. Well, and in the end, you still make, you make your way through this, this tunnel of, of all this stuff. And eventually it's camera and people in a room. And uh, it's the same, it's the same thing. It just kind of gets, it gets smaller and there's just more and more layers outside. It's like a, a, like a gobstopper you know you have these all these right. layers of candy but like really in the heart of it it's no different than a, a film school shoot you know so it, it can look really intimidating on the outside but in the end um once you kind of get your bearings it's it's uh it's just nuts and bolts you're just in there you know making it you know all the fancy gear and all that stuff and a lot of times you're just like let's let's go handheld let's just like get rid of one of the cameras it's just one camera the actor and let's keep the sets open and um and so there's a little bit of irony to that Definitely. And that's, it's very interesting you bring that up because I've heard that a lot from a lot of creative artists, whether they're actors, DPs, people working on set, directors, from the outside looking in, it's you look at the showbiz aspect of Hollywood and all of that. But when you actually get into the nitty gritty of it, and it's, it's a very intimate setting where they're essentials. You have the actor, the DP, the director. Of course, we have all the lights and all of that, but it's a very small little tight-knit group there. I'm really curious about this, especially with someone with your background. When you first started off in this industry, did your career have a linear trajectory where it was you did one job and then you assumed that you know the next job would be this and then followed by that and followed by that? Or was it more so like a pinball machine and a roller coaster where it kind of you had one roll here and then all of a sudden something there and there and nothing really linear? How would you describe your career path so far? Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, I feel like it's probably been generally linear, but um, but by no means does that mean it, it has felt smooth and easy and, um, you know, like I knew the next thing that was coming. I think one of the toughest things, at least starting out, is that you're I mean, you're you're. I'm still a freelancer. And so you get, it's a job to job thing. And uh, in the beginning, it was really just as long as I'm shooting, I'm happy to be shooting. And I was fortunate that whether I was able to do really small budget music videos where I'd get a little bit of money or if it was a freebie, but it helped with an opportunity or mm-hmm. I hoped it would help it with an opportunity. It was a lot of that. And it was really just about as long as I can keep shooting and um, not have to do anything else. Um, and, you know eventually hopefully things will build up and i was fortunate uh, that that was my path because i think a little bit more typical of a path would be you get an opportunity say as a, as a camera assistant and or an operator or uh moving your way up and then eventually you get to shoot um and for me i was able to hold out and just shoot and um and i guess a little bit of the ping pong element would be that uh in the beginning i'm just kind of taking everything i i can any opportunity is a good right. opportunity and um and so I'd shoot different genres. I'd shoot with the director that wanted things very fixed or was very uh, hands-on with camera. And then I'd, I'd shoot with somebody else who knew nothing about camera and, or didn't care about camera. Or there was no money for lights or anything. And um, and so in that sense, you, I just, I guess I kind of learned to, to do the best with whatever I had to work with. And sometimes it was very little. Um, and I think that that for me has been a really good uh a uh, way of giving me some diversity and the ability to kind of kind of tackle anything um be adaptive but uh but it's still it's a grind it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to say what the next job is going to be and if it's you know mm-hmm. balancing the right the, the the right creative job with making sure you're still able to make a living uh and um so all those things uh can still be stressful but i it, it definitely feels different starting out than once you feel like you get a few things under your belt it, it can feel your, your confidence can build in the sense of security, but uh, it's it's still same same as we were kind of talking about with the set. It still might seem glamorous on the outside, but it's still it's still a hustle at times. Oh, I bet, especially with 
everything going on right now and what the future of this medium will look like. And we'll dive into that a bit later. Let's transition into Rutherford Falls. It's such a great show and it's a fun show, but more important than all of that is the diversity and inclusion of this show. It's got a large Native American presence on and off screen, and that's very rare in Hollywood and TV productions today. For the viewers listening, can you give us a taste of what this show is about? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a thirty minute comedy on Peacock. It's um, it centers on the relationship of two friends in a, a small northeastern town. Um, it uh, in my I've always looked at it as some having an element of tonally of like Fargo and in Coen Brothers in terms of what we were inspired by, uh, in terms of the way we we shot it. Um, but uh, Ed Helms' character plays a descendant of the, the founders of the town, and uh, his best friend is is a woman named Regan, who's Native American. Um, and uh, there's sort of a uh, inevitably there's a, there's a little bit of a clash of uh, cultures uh, when uh, the town decides to take down the statue that is um, its founding father, Nathan, Nathan Rutherford, Ed Helms' uh, uh, descendant. And of course, he has such family pride that he can't. It, it's unbelievable to him, but uh, it, it leaves open this sort of um, uh, pathway to explore some of these larger cultural issues uh, that I think are very obviously very real and very relevant and important, um, but all you know uh, in the framework of a comedy uh, starring Ed Helms, which is great, and Michael Gray eyes and Jana, who plays Regan, um, Dustin Milligan, um, all extremely talented, funny people. Um, and uh, and that was you know what attracted to me uh, uh, me to it uh, doing it, doing a comedy on its face but something that had a lot more depth to it. Um, so I know that's a that's a long winded answer, but um, uh, but I you know frankly I wasn't really looking to to jump into doing more comedy when um, I had the opportunity to to, to read the script and um, I really responded to it and I thought you know making an exception is the wrong word but it just felt like it felt like the right project and I felt really fortunate to have a chance at it so um. yeah so it's a very contemporary look at just a lot of things people are going through today in North America and that's what I love about the show where it's it has that balance of the comedy aspect of it versus almost that drama part of it as well where it kind of clashes in that nice little medium down the middle where it's not in bad taste or it's not something that's being made fun of it's it's a very interesting show in that sense now collaborating with a man like ed helms how's that like he just seems like he's one of the most coolest men in hollywood <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's he's definitely as as were a lot of the actors like i was saying but uh he he's one of those people that just is it's so much fun to to be on set with them because uh I, you know I'll, I'll do my job to support the show but there are those moments where I get a chance to, to sit back and just watch them work. And, and as, as much as um, uh, the script was, was pretty strong, it wasn't a high, heavy improv show, uh, Ed is always going to give alts and uh, options. Um, and those are, the, those are the most enjoyable parts of the show in my mind is while well, we're making it, is, is just uh, kind of finding a, finding a little crack and, and you can see just performance wise uh, opening that up and, um, and his instincts and uh, and uh, just the his the earnest earnestness with way, which he plays his characters I've always loved and um, and so it's just it's it's fun because you become a spectator in my shoes you know I, I get to watch these people work and um, mm -hmm. uh, enjoy it it's like watching a live show you know and it's a, it's a window to uh, performance that people don't get to see unless you're working on on set um, so. You know, and also that being said, when I he was there when I when I had my initial meeting along with all the other producers, and he cared very much about how it was going to look and um, and uh, just the show in general. You know, he was there as a producer in scenes he wasn't acting in, um, giving feedback and uh, and helping rewrite stuff, and uh, and so that's another thing I also admire is just people that care about the craft so much and um, and the products that they're putting out and. Um, and I did. I felt like that across the board. Everybody really cared about the show while we were making it. That's amazing. Now, on a personal side, as a DP, what's your approach to shooting a project like this in terms of cameras, the focal lengths, the lenses? Is that a collaborative effort with everyone on set with the director? What do you bring to this specific project? 
when I when I went and met with them, I, I also, in addition to recognizing the comedy aspect of it and the depth to the the, the backstory, uh, I also thought that there's no reason that we should shoot this to look like a sitcom. Um, and so I pitched shooting on a large format um, where we get we get more depth separation and um, shooting on prime lenses and not zooms, even though they can be convenient. Um, and those are certain things that you sometimes you have to fight for especially in the comedy world, because uh, mm -hmm. on its face, sometimes that can yeah. make people scared. Um, and so uh, I pitched that and, and that was a little bit of a litmus test, whether intentional or not. And, and everybody was so on board with it. So it made me even more excited because they were willing to uh, put a little bit of extra uh, work and resource into the visual side of it. And that made me feel empowered um, to, to put together my, my best work. And, um, and so for me, uh, that was a big win early on. And, and then uh, another win kind of manifested itself right after I got hired, which was I found out that they hired Larry Scher to direct the first three. Uh, and Larry is, is like an iconic cinematographer. And oh. I had just actually, weeks prior to that, I had just uh, late to the game seen Joker. And of course, was inspired by all of his work on that. And so I went from getting excited to being like, wow, this is gonna be great to being incredibly intimidated um and uh my, in my first call with him i said look <laughs> i'm excited but this is not what i signed up for i, I you know now how am i gonna do this um and uh you know larry's obviously super talented he's also very uh very opinionated and um and in a, in a great way because as a director you have so many different things that you're juggling um, I mean, I feel like there's a lot on your plate as a cinematographer, but as a director, it's uh, it's mind blowing the amount of stuff that comes at them. Um, and he's able to multitask and handle all that stuff and still be right there with me visually. Um, and uh, you know, so we spent a lot of time. He's a, he's a he's a big believer in um, in really di diving in and prep, uh, which I'm as well. So we had a great prep together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and so kind of uh, unexpectedly, I was able to have a very fleshed out uh, visual um, prep with, with the director of the show. And I think that really helped the show. Uh, I learned a lot and I, I continued to be a, sp a sponge while I was also under uh, heavy personal pressure to, to do Larry justice while he was directing and, um, and, you know, and try to maintain that after he left. So, um, so in an episodic show, as, as succeeding directors come through, um, there's this balance of wanting to, to serve the directors as you normally would as a DP, but you also are serving the show that you've been there, you know, that I was there for in the beginning. And um, so sometimes that can be a tricky balance, but um, we, had a, we also had a great group of directors and um, very collaborative and very curious about uh, what we had set up with the show, how it looks, how the camera moves um, and that sort of thing. So, um, so I, I guess in short, yeah, very, very involved in, in, in a way that I think uh, you don't always get that opportunity in comedy, the, the visual side of it was very well supported and considered um, and intentional. So I was happy about that. One thing that I found really interesting in some of the conversation we're having just now is you mentioned in many ways, you're a spectator as well, especially you're in many ways, you are audience zero or you're the guy shooting all of this. And a lot of it's just we're watching this through your lens, literally in many ways and figuratively as well. So my question is specifically when it comes to that, when you're shooting these amazing actors or these amazing stories, when you're recording it, can you tell you're recording something special or is it sometimes as you're so locked into your art, your craft that you're not really even thinking about the performance itself, but rather more so the artistic and technical part of it? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it's, uh, there's enough going on. And, and, uh, and, you know, part of the process for me is always, you're, I'm present while we're shooting the given, like the current take as we're rolling, but while that right. take is rolling, and while I'm watching it unfold, I'm also thinking about what we have going on tomorrow. I'm thinking about the next scene. I'm thinking about the next setup. Um, you know, okay, when, as soon as the director is ready to turn around, this is going to go here and letting people know. So there's a lot of forethought going on, um, that, uh, doesn't necessarily take away from my presence in the moment, but, um, I think, I think moments like that, sometimes it's hard to realize what's happening, unfolding right in front of your eyes in the moment. Um, in, until a few seconds delayed, maybe, you know, you cut and you go, wow, what, what just happened? You know, and especially on some of those things where people are riffing. Um, and I've done shows in the past that were much more improv heavy and, uh, 
Um, right. And sometimes you just see you you feel this momentum. It's almost like being in a in a stadium at a sports event when uh, somebody's rushing for a touchdown, and you can just hear the roar of the crowd building, and you can you can kind of feel it building up inside inside. Um, but when you have a couple talented people, and you can see them them getting on a roll with something. Um, that's, that's pretty invigorating and thrilling to, to see. Um, and we have, we had some moments like that in this, but, uh, but I, I really think anytime uh, Michael, Ed, I mean, a lot of them seeing them on camera, Michael has an am am amazing monologue in episode four, um, that gave me chills even in our, even on our rehearsal that morning. And I had read the script obviously, but to, <laughs> to hear him, to hear him say it was just, right. um, chilling. And, um, and so that, uh, that that's a really fulfilling part of, of what we do, even though, even though in the end, you know, we're not saving lives. Um, but, but uh, doing projects where you feel like the, uh, the message behind it, not just being entertainment, but being something that's going to maybe make people think a little bit um, is it, it makes me feel fulfilled, you know, it makes me feel like we're doing the right thing. And um, you know, as many problems as there are in the world um, that, that making entertainment, uh, can serve as more than just an entertainment and a getaway, but also can, can, um, you know, be fulfilling and open up conversations in a good way. That's, I think, one of the main key points about the show and just what it represents on a larger scale. There's probably someone watching this show for the very first time that may be Native American and they've never seen themselves represented on the screen or on the big screen. And this could literally open their eyes as to that there is like, of course, there's a long way to go for in terms of representation and diversity, but I feel like these are building blocks that are very important that can help shape the next generation of creatives in this medium. Yeah, and, and a big thing too, that there are, there are a lot of things that my, I'm learning along the way too <clears throat> about culture and um, a, a really interesting thing that I saw uh, throughout the course of the show is that uh, Michael's character, for instance, um, he plays a casino owner and uh, he's kind of the antagonist to, to Nathan, Ed's character. And of course, everybody's on board with Ed. He's the most earnest, likable. Uh, his character yeah. is earnest and likable and lovable. And um, But what, what I thought was really great uh, and and I hadn't considered was was the fact that there, it's not a black hat, white hat show. It's, there's not like the good guy and the bad guy. Um, you know, Nathan is just as much of a bad guy as Terry could, could be uh, um, framed as. And so uh with uh sierra and the writers and and michael and the way they treated his character the intention was that uh uh he's a real person he's not he's not the native american that you know speaks a certain way and and you know the way that natives have been depicted in, in yeah. entertainment and media for, for since the beginning and i thought that that was really um important to them and and now in retrospect so important to the show um that that it's an avenue to, to show that that people shouldn't just be represented in one light and you have to make a conscious effort to to do that and and i think that that's that's great and i'm i'm, I'm proud that the show that the show did that i can't take credit for anything besides supporting it uh, uh but i was honored that i was able to absolutely and here's to the next generation of filmmakers and creatives being inspired from a show like this so uh, I'm gonna transition over to the impact of COVID on this industry, especially as someone who shot during COVID. What do you think is the future of filmmaking, television making in terms of how you guys shoot on set? And what was your personal experience like on a set where you guys are heavily restricted in, in terms of keeping your distance, masking up? Well, how was that whole experience for you? Um, it was, I mean, we, we talked about it a lot, obviously, as we got back into prep and, um, and they reworked some things. We added a, a full-time third camera crew, um, not because we shoot, I mean, there are a lot of scenes that we shot single camera, um, but we added a third full-time camera crew, um, and we were able to use three at once sometimes, but also there's that kind of safeguard that if one camera crew goes down to, due to a positive test and contact tracing, you still have yeah. to. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were things like that, that we were able to, um, the producers were able to, to kind of integrate into the uh, 2.0 of the show, uh, which helped a lot. We, sh we had uh, remote heads on the cameras full time on A and B camera, which was it's an extra expense and it's an extra mm. logistical thing. But, you know, in, in the interest of having less bodies in on the set close with the actors, 
Um, so really in the end, it's basically just a dolly grip and a remote head in there with the actors when you're shooting um, for a lot of it. And so there are like technical things that we did like that to, to adjust. Um, and lighting in waves where, you know, we would, we would rehearse and then they would have, okay, this, the set deck crew can come in and then, okay, right. once they're out now the grip and electric can come mm -hmm. in. And, uh, and so stuff like that just takes time. And it, I think it's very difficult because we're, we're such a fast paced business and everybody is, is so focused on doing their jobs and working tightly uh, next to each other. Um, and so it took a lot of awareness. Um, and I can't say it, it went as smooth as you as you could hope right. but um mm -hmm. uh but everybody was working towards a common cause and so it was never it was never uh bad in that sense but it just uh it it, it was definitely a big a big uh, curveball um oh, I bet. but uh i think i think the effort combined with just everybody's gratitude to to be working and thankful for what we do uh really really was what helped us overcome it and and at its heart uh, filmmaking is such an adaptive it's such a problem solving industry oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you shoot an exterior scene and the sun is out in the beginning and storm comes in and you got to keep shooting because you can't afford to push on a dime. And, um, and that's what we're kind of bred to do. So um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, as we got our feet underneath us, uh, we, uh, we got quicker and we were able to solve things better. And, um, and I think that'll, that helps us grow, uh, you know, whether things go back to kind of completely maskless and, yeah. The same as they used to be on set. I think that we'll all have gleaned some um, uh, some efficiency, some little areas that we can improve our efficiency and things like that. We did a lot of remote monitoring stuff that was incredibly useful. Um, that I hope we can, you know, more shows can afford uh, going forward. Uh, you know, things like you know having a having a remote monitor where you can look on your iPad. So we're setting up a shot, and the AD team can be setting background, mm -hmm. looking at their monitors instead of everybody having to run back and crowd around something. Uh, things like that, that regardless COVID or not, masks or not, uh, just made things quicker, smoother, uh, and better. Um, and so I'm doing the show that I'm doing now in Virginia. We're using the same, it's Q-Take is the name of the system um, where you can remotely monitor. And um, and uh, that's that's been super helpful. Um, but, uh, you know, and the other, the other thing is there's been less time, less, you know, shorter shoot days. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like they're going to change the scripts to <laughs> to be less interesting yeah. or less you know they're gonna so you're always trying to figure out ways to to fit all that work and um um but at the same time it's it's nice because i've been able to get home and see my kids at the end of work days a little bit more often than i used to so that's that's good too so um you know the film business is resilient and i think uh i think whatever the next pandemic or whatever is god forbid <laughs> Um, we'll, you know, we'll probably again be at the forefront of problem solving it and uh, doing it the right way. So I'm also proud to be a part of an industry that, um, that largely has, has, has handled it very smoothly. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see in the next couple of years, some of the lessons that the film industry can take away from a pandemic like this and how they implement that and apply it to their everyday shoots. Because like, as you mentioned, there's probably ways that have become more efficient and maybe even cost friendly for a lot of studios. Uh, and we'll, we'll just happen to see with the innovation that's been going on with all of this. On the last topic of creative arts, cinematography, what does the word creative arts mean to you? Ooh, uh, creative arts to me is, is pretty universal. I think it's everybody's got, whether, whether you're uh, um, considered to be an artist, you know, in your job or, or whatever, I think everybody has a creative spirit. And so that it could be cooking, it could be, uh, it could be, it, it really is anything that you have that, that is an outlet, um, for you to, uh, not have to follow an instruction manual. Um, and, uh, I think, I think it can be difficult for people, um, who are very technical minded to, to find that, or to even have the desire to find that. But, um, I think everybody has a creative spirit and um, you know, some people, some people happen to have a creative spirit that's hundred percent creative and they're not technical at all. And they're not uh, structured, you know um, and some people are very structured and um, you know, kind of split their time. And I, I feel like photography is kind of one of those disciplines where, like I said earlier on is you're, you're dealing with the very technical side of things and trying to figure out how, how to represent emotion that way and um, let go it at the same time. So um so I think I think it can vary, and I think it's very open. But 
uh, I think it's a spirit. It's an outlet. Um, and it serves people to different degrees. So, but worth pursuing yeah. for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And that's an awesome answer, man. I really appreciated your candid, honest opinion about that because it's true. It's, it's a subjective and it's very personal to each and every one of us. As you mentioned, what you may be great at, I may not and vice versa. And we all have that creativity within us in one shape, way, or form. And it's up to us to let that flourish. Totally. As we wrap up, Ross Rigi, it is now time for a segment I like to call the final act. Ross, I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions about your likes, your dislikes, but the catch. So we're going to try to get through them in 60 seconds. If you can get through them in the time, great. If not, it's all good. I just want the first thing that pops into your mind. You up for the challenge? Bring it. Movies or TV shows? Movies. Theater or watch at home? Theater. Favorite movie? Uh... <laughs> Office space. All right. Favorite TV show? Game of Thrones. All right. One sequel better than the original. Bad Boys 2. Should Hollywood reboot Back to the Future? Yeah. Summer or fall? Fall. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Mm, nah. Take it or leave nah. it. No judgment. <laughs> Film or digital? Film. Favorite camera to shoot on? Alexa. Lastly, describe Rutherford Falls in one word. Important. Bam. Hey, we got through all the questions. And hey, you're one of the only few people that said Hollywood should reboot Back to the Future. So that's, it's really interesting. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I the guts well, on that. Que- <laughs> that I appreciate I'll the guts on the same answer. category as my... Yeah, I'll put that in the same category as Office Space being my movie answer because that's not. A, those are probably heresy. Those responses, but I'm trying. Wow. I was trying to get get into the end of the time. You know, it's it's all good, man. And thank you so much for coming to hang on the show today, Ross. I'm so proud of all your amazing work, and thank you for your contributions to the creative arts. The show is absolutely amazing, as well as I love The Walking Dead, World Beyond, and your work just continues to just usher in just such great television and. Hopefully we can do this again soon to talk about your next project. I wish you all the best in all your future work. Thank you. Thanks for having me.